Thank you all for being here. I'm, um, I've just totally drawn a blank. <laughs> so um, bear with me a little bit. Um, Oh, I guess I'll start um, from the beginning. Um, oh, I don't know how long ago, probably half a year ago, I was talking with Karen and Andy, and we were just talking about how we create our work. And, um, you know, I know Andy listens to audiobooks, and I listen to audiobooks or music. And, and Karen says, I do my work completely in silence. And I was so intrigued by that because I've always had something in the background. And so I, um, I said, okay, I'm just going to try it. I'm going to, you know, just give it a go. And um, this work takes a long time to make. <laughs> it's quite the contrast of yours, which I would love to have that spontaneity, you know, Kalaya. But um, this is a very, some of it is painstaking and some of it at the same time, it can be very spontaneous. So um, I think that the idea that I captured from Karen was just that when you're working in silence, you're just fully present. You're just working that grain of your sensitivity and your sensibilities and your stories. And um, it's, a, it's kind of a, a vulnerability that um, can be kind of surprising and kind of terrifying at the same time because, um, you know, your mind wanders to the menacing, whether grief or beauty or lonesomeness, or, you know, some friends that you miss or somebody, you know, that you have a connection with that you don't have in your life anymore. And so um, a lot of this work is out of that. And there were, um, I think, um, you know, they, it usually starts with a question about something or a thought about something, and then the idea just comes to say, oh, okay, I think this is what I want it to look like. And so um, it's, which was really interesting to listen to Becca because your work you create as you're responding to it. And um, I don't have a pre-established, like my materials aren't pre-established, but they're um, just kind of going in a certain direction with the composition. And um, so, but just um, going, backing up a little bit to the idea of substrate, I brought a picture of a tree. And I, you guys can pass this around if you'd like. But this was in um, southern Brazil where I grew up. And there was this tremendous forest that was um, cut down to plant the green gold, which was coffee. And so, um, some of the wood from this forest they used for the urban construction, just the civil construction. And so um, that particular tree is called a pitaba. And the soil there was so rich. It was just dark purple. And, um, you know, it's like 20 feet of topsoil. It's just phenomenal. And um, these trees have all these little root filaments in the soil. And wherever there's a concentration of minerals, they'll pick up those minerals and they'll create the figuring within the wood. And I like to use all my wood, or most of my wood, very few exceptions at the cross, cross grain. I like cross cuts so that I can see just wood from a perspective that you don't normally see. I like to see the little rings or the, and so, um, you know, that, that, like that circle in this long piece, that's from that kind of a tree. And two pieces, the one in the, between the two darker pieces, the very weathered surface, and then the one inside are also that same kind of tree. So um, the thing about this wood that's interesting is that it can sit in the elements for six, you know, 60, 70, 80 years, and it won't rot. So I can take that weathered piece of wood and just sand it a little bit. And it's just this beautiful, dense, satiny, it almost feels like, like skin, you know, it's just such a beautiful wood. And um, I just want to connect that with something I've heard recently that, um, you know, it's, it doesn't take long for us to see each other's faults, but to see each other's virtue, it just takes time. It takes a while. 
And so um, I can look at this old wood and I can just, you know, it's kind of ugly and, you know, um, uninteresting. And, um, but as I spend time with it, it's just like, it just opens up all this beauty. And um, I think, um, you know, it's easy. Just recently, I was in a meeting and the person next to me came in and just had a lot of, odor you know and it was just interesting because everyone else in the room spoke so kindly to this woman and i realized she has something so beautiful in her and i just was so quick to you know like not, not think too highly you know because of a, a passing trait a passing moment and um i just i think through this process and in, in being silent in just the things that I've just you know thought through and um, I just I think I realize how um, I just want to be a person who not only has the freedom to be vulnerable but gives each other the freedom and the grace to be vulnerable you know to to just um, you know, really see each other. And my husband's in the back corner. And one thing I deeply appreciate about him is how he really looks to see the person, you know, and just look deeply. And um, he sees the substrate and he encourages that and speaks, you know, calls that out. And um, so, um, yeah, I guess. Um, it just takes a lot of courage and vulnerability and um, sometimes it's scary and it's scary to paint a lot of black sticks and spend a lot of time pointing black sticks and you know or to pour paint over your gold leaf you know and see what happens and so um and you know the vicissitudes of life do that to us you know they just they come and they transform us too so um that's kind of a little bit of what's, you know, just thinking through um, in a very summarized way. Um, these pieces, um, the gold has always been something that I've enjoyed working with in my life. I think it just has um, a reference to eternal for something that's so much more expansive and greater, God. You know, just a whole, um, you know, it encompasses all that we move in, that we breathe in, and just, you know, there's something that's so um, whole about our existence here. And um, I know even if it's just a little sheet, I, I just like the, you know, just to use it as language. And um, I've used milk paint. And I, I literally put varnish on this gold and then just poured milk paint on it, and let it sit for a while, sometimes poured water on it, see what happens, shake it, tilt it, you know, just to see what was happening in the background. Some I left purposely um, in a puddle and it just crackled, which was in this case of this one with the circle. And um, so it was, you know, Kind of exciting and joyful at the same time, just to see what was going to happen. And um, so, and then the, I don't know, I think the, the black um, has a, a um, you know, um, I don't, the word isn't formality. I mean, we, we paint because we don't use words well, at least I don't, you know. <laughs> So, um, I don't know, it just, there's just a, a reverence in it, you know, there's, it's just a, there's a simplicity to it as well. And so I kind of wanted to just use black and gold as a, as a language. And then there were a few spots where I had a little bit of pink, you have to look for them. And that's influence from my friend, Karen, <laughs> too. And, um. So that's kind of a little bit of these. 
Um, the sticks, I've, for a long time, I just worked more with the very precise, you know, polished surfaces. And, um, and after a while, I just found that the sticks gave me a spontaneity that I didn't have with the, you know, with these cut, you know, pieces. And the same with the dots. And so, you know, in some of them, I would just pick up the sticks and I'm just kind of throw them on there and see what it looked like. And then, you know, kind of start composing and moving things and, and um, then attaching them is a whole different story. So, you know, they say the height of creativity is the moment of conception. Everything else is blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> so that's so true. And, um, and um, so, um, yeah, I just, um, Somehow came together. <laughs> so um, I, um, in closing, I just wanted to read something to you, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through it, but it's about a substrate, and the person um, whom I deeply love and admire, who had a profound substrate, and it's my mom, and this piece is about her. And um, I just want to read an example. This is a book that um, my husband put together for my mom when she was diagnosed with cancer. And all of her, we wrote her friends and they sent these letters to Glenn saying what they appreciated about her life. And so it was just a beautiful way to express that, you know, while she was still around. And... Um, Did have it right here, but ah, okay. So um, this is a friend of my sister's, and she gave me permission to read this. Okay, and she was pretty young; she was probably in her early twenties when when this happened. But she says, "When I arrived, I was tired and cold from the drive. I rang the doorbell and was warmly greeted." Marge led me to the kitchen, the warmth of the kitchen, full of conversation, and the aroma of soup called my chill to re caused my chill to retreat. Marge said, are you hungry, dear? I nodded. I was shown to a place at the table. I slid on the bench in front of the beautiful table, complete with the full place setting, cloth placemats, flowers, warm bread. Her face beamed, full of warmth and love. She placed a steaming bowl of soup before me. As I started to heat, eat, I heard her say, there's plenty more if you like. I had to fight back the tears. I was so hungry for the warmth and love in that kitchen. As I ate my soup, my physical hunger faded. And so did a little of the deep hunger in my soul. I realized that Marge wasn't just offering me soup. She was offering me one of my first tastes of something so much greater. Until that time, life hadn't had ever offered me plenty more. I hold this image of Marge standing in the kitchen as a treasure in my heart, always with plenty more. So um, <coughs> that's a person who lived from a substrate of there was always more to give. There's always a deeper well. There's always more and I just want to honor her so that's that I'm curious when you started working with wood and kind of what was the initial kind of that initial inspiration yeah so um, I'm I'm like you I'm I can't say I'm really self-taught because I've had a lot of people give me input and feedback, but I've, you know, I'm not formally taught, I guess I would say. Um, we were living in Brazil in the region where that tree is passing around wherever. And um, my kids were kind of just finally, the youngest was in preschool and I just had a few hours a week. So um, I started, I took a little a class and I was just carving um, utilitarian objects. And I would always carve leaves or something you know, from nature. And um, 
I just needed some forms to carve. So I went and met this um, older gentleman who had this, you know, huge where it wasn't really a warehouse. I don't even know what you call it, but um, he um, just full of wood and all kinds of like old, old, heavy machines. And he had mountains of scraps of wood everywhere. And um, so I would just go and he wouldn't, he would never take my work. I would, so I would just keep going back. And every time I went back, I was just fascinated by his work and just by the smell of the wood. And he was making furniture and little boxes and utilitarian objects. And finally one day, I think he saw my persistence and he just had pity on me. So, and I asked him to start teaching me to work with the wood. And um, one of them is this big, you know, um, orbital sander. And um, I think the first day I used that thing, I had band-aids on every finger. <laughs> so just because it grabs and the wood pulls and, you know, you just have to learn how to measure that. And um, um, it just, for some reason, um, a couple of young architects had invited, asked me to make a mural for their studio and um, for their office. And so um, I had little kids at the time and I took inspiration from their toys. And so I made this series of blocks and triangles with circles in them. And so um, that's kind of where it all started. And then I was invited by an architect's group to show work there. But it was all just kind of random you know and um so then we moved to the u.s when our oldest was ready for college and um i just bought some equipment and set up a studio and you know, <laughs> thanks to friends <laughs> who <laughs> taken me in and let me show so with your work do you see it as um it floats between um, assemblage, sculpture, object, painting, where, where do you see it going? Do you feel like you're in tune with one or the other more than, you know, one more than the other? Yeah. Yeah. It's an identity crisis. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I really like the variety just because it stays interesting you know and sometimes i start with something and i want to um use want to combine languages um but i guess um i would say that i'm tending more towards sculpture and i would like to depart from the two-dimensional and go to the three and um i'm not sure i've been thinking so much about it and it just hasn't quit yet so um and I'd like to have pieces that don't have such, you know, like confined edges. I'd like to just be able to be outside of the, you know, the edges. But I also, I don't know, I also kind of like the frame when it comes to the point of framing it. It feels like when you're, when I first start working, it's like this rough thing that, you know, if you drop it or whatever, it doesn't matter. But as it gets closer and closer to the end, you know, it just feels like something more precious, you know, so you start treating it with more care and holding it lightly and approaching the sander carefully <laughs> until, you know, then finally when I frame it, it's like, oh, I don't want to you know, damage anything here. So. Um, so you mentioned how you physically handle the um, pieces as you work through them. Do you feel also that your mindset or your spirit also evolves as uh, you take the time completing these pieces. Um, yeah, Sarah, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it does because um, I'm trying to articulate something that's just, you know, in material that's very interior, and I'm trying to um, give it a language in a way, and um, and then. You know, sometimes this language isn't enough, so I mm -hmm. just have to keep working it, you know, until it, it gets to where um, I can say, yeah, this is what I want to express. 
Um, I really like your art, uh, and it's so calming. Um, and I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, so when you said that you had hand painted uh, these wooden, oh sorry, I have two questions. So when you hand painted these wooden sticks, um, um, like did you? How did you paint them? Because they look uh, as if they were. Um, I don't see any trace of like uh, brush strokes or anything. Mm -hmm. And my second question is: um, so all this wood is from the tree in the picture that you uh, showed us. Oh, okay, good questions. Yeah. Um, no, all the, these are from all different kinds of trees. Okay, and then um, some of them are pieces of skateboard, you know, and uh, yeah, just that I've reclaimed and painted over those and sanded it and um, burned or whatever, you know, just um, just different ways that I've that I've used it. Um, but the black sticks, I've um, because the sticks are sharp, you know, and they're splintery and kind of painful sometimes. Um, I, at times I've left them where they're very raw. And other times I've just receded and I've sanded. After I painted the first coat, I'd sand it and then just apply a very watery coat over the top. And it just creates this kind of a softness to it. But um, I also apply a varnish to all my work. just for preservation and that does tend to make it sometimes i think it's too uniform and i don't really like that but um so i'll go back and use something else on it to try to draw it out but um yeah it doesn't yeah i've i've had pieces that are a little more this one was one that i um i just kind of very um very quickly spread the paint and wasn't concerned about you know, how it, you know, if it was gloppy or not, or if it was hiding, you know, the sharp edges or not. I have an artist friend who years ago kind of playfully, he said that an artist friend of his, I don't even know who, mm -hmm. um, said that um, if anybody ever points out something in, in your work that's a flaw, um, and they say, what, what, what happened here? You just basically tell them, oh, that's, that's nuance of process. And, and that just kind of shuts down the conversation. Like, oh, oh, that's what it is. I'm curious. I'm sure it wasn't a flaw, but I, I am curious whether it's a mundane reason or if it's, it was not, you know, whatever, where it is on the continuum, why you open the frame on that piece. On that piece. On the end. Yeah. Because it was a piece of me that was taken or gone or lost or you know so I don't want to I just it's I think um when we lose somebody we're never fully you know that person again or something so it's just an expression